Good morning all and welcome back to our continuing series of weekly CPDs. This time it's all about the insect factor in wood decay. I'm Andy Ferguson and joining me today to talk about all these little critters is Rentical's UK Technical Services Manager but also a key member of numerous PCA techn technical committees. I have to say it, the one the only Mr. Nicholas Donathorn. Good morning, Nicholas. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And how are you, good sir, this morning? Uh, fine, thank you. Well, <laughs> well here, folks, um, firstly, uh, big thanks to everyone joining us. If you are one of our regular listeners, a big extra big thanks to yourself for tuning back into us. If you are one of our new listeners, then a very big welcome to yourself. We hope you enjoy the webinar today and you really get some valued learning from today as well as the chat also. Now, just talking about chat, I just want to kind of point out a couple of things just to individuals. Um, we are always keen to hear from you. We're always keen to kind of hear your questions. Now, First place, I just want to point you to that if you do have any questions over the course of the webinar, if you are on a desktop, if you look to the left or the right of you, there should be um, a chat functionality for yourself there. Just simply just use those fingers and rattle away on the keyboard and find your question over to us. Equally, if you just want to say a little quick hello to us and tell us what you guys are up to while we're waiting, then we love to hear that too. If you're on a mobile device, uh, very similar as well. However, if you just scroll up just a little bit, you will see that chat functionality just in there. Again, feel free to rattle away using those fingers and say a little hello to us. But there is alternative ways in which you can also raise those questions over to us. You can either email it to myself directly and I'll pose them to Nicholas at the end. That's just simply at andy at property-care.org. That's Andy at property-care.org or if you are so socially savvy you can visit us via our um, numerous um, social media channels either go to LinkedIn, Facebook or Twitter use the search facility that's on there simply type in property care association and hopefully hopefully we should pop up and rattle your question via that way um just a kind of point, just a, I just want to kind of say, now we are aware that at nine o'clock everyone's turning on their PCs, there's generally quite a pool of individuals using the internet. Um, Joe Wicks is starting at nine o'clock, so all the kids yeah. up and down the country are all bouncing away in the living rooms. If it just so happens you do have a problem um, during the course of the webinar where it crashes out or there's sound, there should be a reconnection button that pops up for you. If you just simply use that reconnect button, a reconnection button, you should be able to get right back on to the webinar. Um, just looking at the time here, Nicholas, uh, I can see we've got a couple of minutes to kill before we start on the live webinar. I can see that an audience is actually building. A big hello to everyone who's saying hello via the chat. Um, just while we've got a little bit of time, Nicholas... It's been a while since I've seen you, mate. Um, just for the benefit of the audience, Nicholas and I actually uh, worked together for a little while, didn't we, Nicholas? But we're in very, um, very different departments over the same company. But I have to say, the last time that we met, which was at the PCA um, conference, you were listening and chatting to Woodworm. And in fact, I'm pretty <laughs> sure you were headbanging away to them to status quo, were you not? <laughs> well, I've got to talk to somebody and they don't talk back. <laughs> well, maybe they do. So tell me. I'm not I mean, listening well enough. Status quo. I mean, a, a, a woodworm seemed to love status quo. How the heck did you even come across that? Uh, no, no, that was just my, my little joke, as it were, because status quo, if you're known as headbangers, don't we just know it? So, um, yes, that's where it came from. I take it there's no other kind of tunes in the mix at the moment in time that no. our woodworm lovers yeah. are loving. No, that um, Death Watch is roughly 10 beats a second, and I don't think even Status Quo can manage 10 beats a second. Yeah, I think even with me, 
I, I think even with me sugared up with Red Bull and caked up with Greg's, I couldn't even do that myself. <laughs> I'm sure you'd have a good try, though, Andy. Yeah, and I'm sure I would have a bash, good sir. I'm sure I would have a bash. Oh, but folks, just for everyone that's just kind of joined us quite recently, I can see just over the last couple of minutes there's been a bunch of you've just jumped on. If you're wondering who the two individuals are talking about, headbanging woodworm um, <laughs> and the Ferguson from the Property Care Association, and joining me today is Nicholas Donovan from Rent to Kill UK. Um, here all to talk about the insect factor and wood decay. Now, just for the benefit of all the new individuals that have just jumped on, I do apologise to anyone that's heard this spiel already. But over the course of the webinar, if you do have any questions uh, or you do just want to kind of throw up anything, there is a chat facility there that you can use on the desktop, it's depending on your settings, it will either be there or there to the left or right. Simply use the comments button and just fill it in there. If it's a mobile, you just need to pull it up and you can see the comments facilities there. You can always email your questions over to myself at andy at property-care.org. Or if you are, again, socially savvy, you can visit us via our social channels and fire the question over that way. Um, looking at the time, I can actually see that I've nicely rounded off and it is bang on nine o'clock. So I believe we're really at that time for the main presentation to start. Um, so I suppose the insect factor in wood decay. Nicholas, what are these tiny critters? What are the more unusual insects that are messing up our timbers? And what should our procedures be? Nicholas, I know this presentation is right up your <laughs> I suppose it's over to yourself, mate, to get stuck in about it. Right, well, let's see if we can manage this without mucking up. How about that? That looks okay to me. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for joining joining me from your work because I appreciate we are starting at nine so I'm sure a lot of you would rather be somewhere else. Uh, let's just see where we go. So that's me, uh, most of you know who, who you are. Uh, Andy asked me to talk though to people who've joined us who are not necessarily members of the PCA. Um, that is a very old photo of me doing some research back in about 1987 when I was working on permethrin. Um, so the insect factor in wood decay. So I'm going to try and cover um, try and cover quite a bit of territory. Uh, from what Andy has given me, I'll deal with the insects, I'll deal with the surveying, but I will deal with the surveying factor whilst I talk about the insects, if that's okay with you, because I think that's the easiest way to go along. But firstly, I'll just sort of give you an introduction as to why we have the problem we do, to give you the start of the story. So just to let you know and to provide you with information for later, beetle biology research, most of it was done between 1880 and 1940. Um, once we had usable insecticides, a lot of the research stopped because we knew how to kill things. And they're the people I dealt with um, when I first started out in 1980, um, the great Professor Norman, uh, Dr. Norman Hickin. Uh, amongst others, and Robin Edwards, who was our company photographer. And it was Norman who wrote the first easily accessible book in 1954, basically called Woodworm. And there he is doing what hopefully I'm doing today, uh, which is to give presentations to people, which is what he did um, going around the country, uh, starting late 40s, um, even long before we had a service, um, and he wrote an awful lot of books. They are still available if you want to go and look. Uh, the reason they're still usable is because he did use a lot of that very early research and brought it into one place where people could use it. And then Dr. Brian Ridout, um, a lot of people in the PCA will know him. He's published the more recently available books. His original one on the left there and the one that he published last year uh, Brian, as many of you will know, is one of the lead authorities on Death Watch Beetle in particular. And he's the sort of chap who's done the research, sat there in lofts, looking at bits of timber and looking at seeing what is actually going on to provide us with the information we need. And then the other research is around uh, Gervais. Many of you will know 
lead authority on things like Powder Post. The gentleman on the right, many of you won't know, Dr. Darren Mann, friend of mine, um, he's the Beetle curator at the Oxford uh, Natural History Museum. You can see a lot of pin beetles there. Again, he's very much on powder post beetles, but you know any beetles at all, he can identify them. And the only other place I'm really finding anything on beetle life cycle these days is East European institutes, but they are research papers. You really have to read them very carefully to find anything of uh, use out of them. So why do we have a problem? Heartwood and sapwood. So hopefully you all know that heartwood is the dead bit of the tree on the inside and sapwood is the live bit of tree on the outside. That's the bit that our beetles really want to eat or our beetle larvae really want to eat. Um, that's a piece of oak sleeper I saw. So you can see even though there's a lovely bit of heartwood in there, there's quite a large band of sapwood. And generally it takes 15 to 20 years to form heartwood in most trees. So that means, of course, if you are felling trees, say at 30 years old, 25, 30 years old, which a lot of the fast grown conifers are, you're going to have a lot of sapwood in there. As we can see in the smaller photograph on the right, you can see even though that has come from, if I remember rightly, Finland, you've got varying degrees of heartwood and sapwood in there. And what I was trying to show in the picture down at the bottom is when you do cut up a log, depending on how you cut it up, will depend on how much sapwood you have. And particularly when um, you're, you've taken out the important bits in the center, you will end up with a lot of little cuts on the outside. And it's those little cuts that very often end up um, as tiling batten or live and plaster battens. And of course, they will very often be 100% sapwood, which is the bit, again, our insect larvae want to eat. And just to give you some indication of why this is important, when we're surveying, why has the piece of timber disintegrated as much as we can see? Is it because it's all sapwood? Is it because it's got wet? Is it because there's fungal decay and insects? What are the reasons why? And have we found the reasons why? You know, very often when we go into a property, what we actually see now may be due to something that happened in the past and has now been fixed. So a large roof leak may not be easily evidenced now other than by the large attack by wood boring beetles. Um, and those pictures there just represent different forms of decay. It's also important that when we're surveying, we can understand what timbers we're looking at because if you're looking at a piece of oak and it's got very large oval holes in it, particularly near the bark, it is likely to be oak longhorn. Um, if it's a piece of pine and it's got very large ovalish holes in it, it is likely to be house longhorn if you're in the right area of the country. So making sure we know our conifers from our broadleaf trees, our softwoods from our hardwoods, is important as we do our surveys and it's even more important with fungi because some fungi will only grow on hardwoods some will only grow on softwoods so we have typical conifer there scott's pine and a typical hardwood tree an oak tree and you may say why the heck is he now showing a sweet chestnut and common hazel coppice again a very good reason why as i've put the um years in there for you. If you are coppicing timber, in other words, you, you're trying to get a product off that um, tree, so you keep on cutting the stump, it keeps on regrowing. That was originally used for charcoal, but it can be used for lava and plaster, particularly for wattle and daub, which is the picture on the bottom right there. And again, if you go into an older property, and I appreciate we are looking at the uh, timber frame buildings, and you've got an outbreak of death watch or common furniture beetle and you just can't work out where it is, have you thought about it could be in the wattle and door plaster? As we can see the small holes in that uh, sweet chestnut paling. So these are important things to understand when you're surveying as where things come from. And in more modern properties, Victorian 
um, early part of the last century, when you've got your larve and plaster ceilings, as I said earlier on, those larves are, are very often going to be predominantly sapwood. If they get damp, they will provide a very good source of food for common. And just going on, Andy wanted me to talk about some of the unusual um, insects as well. We now have timber produced um, in mass production for consumer goods. This is one particular tree uh, predominantly grown by the Chinese or for the Chinese market, but also over in Australia and New Zealand, Paulonia. Uh, we can find it in parks in this country. But those gentlemen are standing next to 15 weeks worth of growth when you've gone and basically coppiced that tree. So they will grow very, very fast. They can be cut down very, very early and they will be 100 percent sapwood. So when they are con turned into consumer goods, if they do get infested, usually by um, powder, powder post beetles and bostrychids, there's an awful lot of food in there for them. Um, right, let's move on. And construction type. Again, it's important when we're looking at buildings, do we understand the history of buildings? Do we understand what might be um, buried underneath the surface of what looks like an innocent building? A lot of people get old barns and they convert them into houses. If that old barn there is an old oak timbered barn and it's been leaking a lot and it's got a historic infestation of um, death watch beetle, have people sorted that out first before they start to, to turning it into a family home? I get called out to so many Finnish family homes in old barns where they start hitting, hearing knocking in the timbers and then we've got a hell of a job to try and treat the property or to dry it out and try and get to the problem. And those two uh, brick buildings um, in the top, the one on the left is East Grinstead in Sussex. The one on the right is uh, near Huntingdon, as it happens. But both of them, believe it or not, have got a buried timber frame underneath the brickwork. And of course, when bricks became popular and people wanted to show they had money, very often, rather than uh, pull a house down and start from scratch, they would infill round the timber frame. Uh, sometimes they completely hid it. And on both of these two occasions, they have completely hidden the timber frame. Um, on the right, the only reason we can tell that one's got a, tim a very old property in there is because of the stack and because of the size of the bricks. Right, so moving on. And as those of, those of you, as Andy said, listen to me at the PCO, PCA, you will know that I do keep breeding colonies of these insects. It's my hobby, as it were. Um, a lot of research these days is done by amateurs like myself. But in keeping breeding colonies, and it's not easy to do so, you can at least try and learn things about them. Um, this is my death watch colony. Um, it is breeding um, very, very slowly. And one of the things I have learned from that, which I think a lot of us do know, is that I put some fresh oak sapwood blocks underneath the main infested timber. And amazingly, when I lifted up to do some spring cleaning just to check it was all still alive, I found those very, very small larvae in the bottom right hand corner there to prove that they have been egg laying. And I actually watched the female egg lay at the time. I was lucky enough. Um, obviously, I'm not watching these all the time. It's a matter of when I happen to go out to the garden shed and have a quick look. Is something going on? And that's how I know from listening to them with a microphone that they are still munching away at Christmas whether they're munching any faster or slower than they would at this time of year is a different matter. But it's not easy to keep breeding colonies going. It is very difficult. Um, you need to water them a bit to try and keep the wood um, moist. And yet yeah, they do die out very easily. Don't tell our clients that. But when you try and keep them in an ordinary house, it's a lot easier. So where does woodworm originally come from? Well, a lot of the researchers, if you want to go out and find death watch larvae, they use crack willow pollarded or oak pollards 
And when they start to get a bit rotten, that is where you will find your death watch beetle and your common furniture beetle. Um, the other bottom photo, um, I've had to use a lime pollard rather than an oak pollard, but you can see if those pollards were to start to decay, it's only a short flight or a short walk into that timber framed building. So that's how they originally came into our buildings. Now it's because we very often take materials from one place to another um, and put them in our lofts and things like that. So woodworm, it's a, a term we use, unfortunately, um, a little too freely because it means the larva of a wood boring beetle rather than one particular species. Most clients, if they ring us up and say, I've got woodworm, they will usually be meaning common furniture beetle. And that generally we expect to find in about 80 percent of homes. The other relatively common beetles we normally talk about, Deaf Watch, House Longhorn, Powder Post and the Wood Boring Weevils. But we have to remember that it's the larvae that does the damage we cannot see. It's the adults that pop out, giving us the flight hole, which is the time that our clients generally tell us, um, I think I've got a problem. And a life cycle, you know, most of you know the life cycle, I would hope. But for those of you who've joined us who don't, common furniture beetle life cycle, three to five years, um, eggs, minuscule, you'll be lucky to see them. Um, that particular photo is one of the few I know of common furniture beetle eggs. That was taken by Robin Edwards, our staff photographer back in the 60s. And it is high magnification because I know that was a birch picture frame he took them on. So that was quite smooth. Um, once those eggs hatch, and they don't take very long to hatch at all. The larva eats the outside of the egg case. It eating the outside of the egg case, it takes in the enzymes from its mother's gut. And those enzymes go into its gut and helps it to break down the fragments of timber that it eats. Eight, again, one of our company photographers has just taken away the surface of the timber so that we can see that little lava in a larval tunnel. Um, they effectively just rip away at the timber with their mandibles and they take in quite large fragments. They don't chew a lot at all, really. And they pass them down their gut and then it's the enzymes in the gut that break down the timber to produce um, the energy that they require. Then generally, um, depending upon the species, in the spring when the adult beetle is due to come out, that larva will munch its way towards the surface of the timber. It will make a pupal chamber. That pupal chamber is fairly empty of frass, of droppings, on purpose because the insect needs to expand. Um, and just like the butterfly life cycle, what happens there is that from your soft skinned larva, you get the hard skinned adult beetle form. And then when it's ready to come out any time between April and September, it bites away the last thin veneer of timber from above its head to create the fly hole and out it pops. And then for most beetles, they do not eat after they have um, come out of the timber. They basically go around, find a mate, um, lay eggs, and drop dead within a few days, weeks, or in the case of Death Watch Beetle, it can be a month or so. Right, so what does woodworm need to survive other than some nutrients? We've got to remember, they can't go to the kitchen sink and get a glass of water to drink. They need water in the timber they are digesting in order to get sustenance. Um, but they don't, compared to fungi, need very much water at all. Now, remember this data is lab data, as it were, because that's the only way of getting this sort of data easily. But if you put eggs on timber between 8 and 12 percent moisture content, they generally will not hatch. If you up the humidity, that helps them to hatch. 
So it's important to understand that timber in a heated house is generally around about 9% moisture content and in a cool house is 15%. So if we're looking at underneath a floor, there will generally be enough humidity um, for you to get an infestation of beetles. If you're up in a roof, they will get fairly well baked. But again, depending upon the species of beetle, they might very well be able to survive. But what you need to remember is it was the moisture content when those eggs were laid that was important. So if the timber was wet when they were laid, you are going to get a good infestation and that will take a good number of years to breed out and die out as the timber dries, as we come in and dry it out with remedial measures. And just to give you an idea what that looks like. So I took that photo over in Northern Ireland. Buried timbers in damp walls are going to support a good infestation of insects. In that particular case, that's common furniture beetle. The photo in the middle, absolutely amazing destruction of the sapwood. You can see the heartwood on the bottom. So those timbers got damp resting on a very damp wall. We got an amazing infestation of common furniture beetle and that has completely destroyed the sapwood. However, you try and jump up and down on that. And it won't. We have death watch beetle infestation. And if you look carefully, um, you can see that it's only we just try and pull. it's only around the outside of that piece of so I, I, oh sorry nicholas i think you're having some sound issues at the moment right okay shall i uh, we go you? Seem to be back here, here folks our apologies if you are hearing those sound issues but back over to yourself nicholas thank you very much okay um, so, yes, because you can see that it's rounded, that's obviously come from the outside of a tree. The bark was there and you can see that the sapwood uh, is infested, but the heartwood is untouched. And the reason is, of course, that piece of timber has now dried out. Um, I know because I can see from the photo in the background that that roof has been re-roofed and there's a bit of pre-treated timber there. So that is probably originally a barn. It's got infested when it was a barn and now somebody's turned it into a family home, and that's why it's drying out. So what are people gonna see? We've got woodworm frass, and it's important as a surveyor that you are able to identify frass as well as flight holes. Um, different frass there in the pictures, so different shapes, different sizes. If you put it between your fingers, different grittiness. Uh, the picture on the right happens to be a load of tolinus, which produces quite a lot of frass out the end, but really packs the frass into its larval tunnels. And your frass are your faecal pellets. So generally they've passed down through the gut, out the other end, and that's what's falling out of the timber. If they just um, mandibulate it and spit it back out, that's called rejectimentia, uh, which some of them do. So our common beetles, I'll shoot through this fairly quickly. You should know this, but I have purposely put a fair amount of detail. Yes. Nice yes. hoodie, as one of my technicians, as one of my technicians said to me, uh, nice hoodie on the top of the head like that. So you can see that a nice dark chocolatey brown color. That particular one, I took it outside for a photograph. It is waving its antennae in the air because it's saying, hmm, this is interesting. Um, I seem to be out in the air and within a few seconds, it had basically flown off with the speed of Superman quite amazingly quickly. And uh, in the bottom there in the blue, believe it or not, they are holes that have been dug through a plastic um, washing up bowl. It's amazing what they will go through. But that has said, common beetle go for sapwood of both softwoods and hardwoods. Be aware plywood and wicker work is particularly good for them. So when you're looking around, make sure you've had a good look at that as well. Um, I'll just deal with biscuit beetle here. Uh, there is a good reason. A lot of us, if you get called out, you can suddenly find a few hundred beetles running around on a windowsill, particularly if you're not between April and September. It's a jolly good idea to double check it's not biscuit beetle stegobium. 
Um, when you get them side by side, it is easy to see they're different. When you're trying to just deal with something in the home, it's not always as easy. But if you look at their heads with Biscuit Beetle, if you remember your cavaliers and round heads from your history, Biscuit Beetle has got a round head and um, Common Furniture Beetle has got a cavalier helmet on it. So they are quite different. Um, and as I said, numbers, generally you don't get that sort of quantity of Common Furniture Beetle running around. Death Watch Beetle. Not seen everywhere, obviously, because it likes hardwood timbers. If you have got a piece of softwood, pine in particular, nailed up against a piece of hardwood, all of which are nice and damp, or there's an extensive infestation, then they will go and eat softwood, but generally they won't. So we are looking at very old buildings, timber frame properties, that sort of thing. Um, generally, that's, that's a sole plate removed from a property you can see that it's made a bit of a mess it's made a bit of a mess because you've got to have the fungal decay to start the attack off but that is mostly heartwood so it's not going anywhere fast and that's why you shouldn't be ripping it out straight away only if there is a problem with what weight it can carry structural integrity uh, we need to be drying those buildings out as rapidly as we can and that will help to degrade the infestation as well um, I've got you a picture of something called Corinetes ceruleus. Um, if you've got those beetles running around a lot in a property, then you know you've got a pretty good death watch attack because Corinetes, steely blue beetle, is a parasite on um, death watch beetle. So they will go and eat them quite nicely. So as I said, you know, beetle that's got quite a long life cycle, but generally in hardwood timbers only. Generally, it's got to be fungal decay, but once you've got a good attack going, then it can go into sound timbers. And uh, unfortunately, I can't do the sound for you today. It's not as easy to do when once you're running one of these presentations. But as you will know, Death Watch beetles, they do have a mating call as such. And as you can see from that sequence of photos I've managed to do for you, they basically rise up on their legs. They bring the head down on the fronds, which is in humans, this little bit here. They basically do a head bang straight onto the timber, but very, very rapidly, as I will show you just here. This is me using a special microphone I got built for myself, and that is the sound profile. So as I said earlier on to Andy, we are looking at 10 beats a second. That is really, really fast. Um, when I produce that sonogram, as it were, you can start to see the actual hits and they will do that in bursts of about 13 beats. And depending on whether they're getting an answer back from their friends or not, or a mate, um, depends on how frequently they will head bang. OK, moving on to House Longhorn Beetle. This is not a common beetle at all, but it attacks softwood timbers, particularly in northwest Surrey. It needs to be very, very warm. Very often you are going to find these in roofs of buildings. Longhorn, because they have long antennae, as you can see, uh, they have an owl-like face on the back of the pronotum, which is the back of the head here, um, and generally two white spots. But we do get them coming in from France on uh, southern pine. We get them from all parts of the globe, actually, if they can get in. And they are a very big, juicy larvae. So sometimes they do survive through to finished products, but they can only go for the sapwood. So in that photo below, you can see that most of the timbers don't look like they're touched at all. But there are two um, timbers on the floor there in the roof, which have been completely decimated. And that's because they were all sapwood. And with these, you do get that ovalish banana shaped flight hole. So it is quite large, six to 10 mil. Um, and you can generally hear the larvae eating in the timber if you've been unlucky to get this. Northwest Surrey, I ask you, um, here you ask, why? Generally, across the whole of the UK, and statistically, that is the warmest area of the UK over, measured over a period of a year. Um, and closely um, mirrors where they live in Central Europe. 
And then the other one we're getting a lot of is the UK forest longhorn beetles. So people with logs, um, log fires, they bring the logs in in the winter. They warm up. If we've had a winter like we've just had, very often you don't have many fires. And what happens, a lot of the forest longhorn beetles live just underneath the bark and they eat a lot of bark and a very small amount of the precambrium. And what will happen is all of a sudden in the spring, and it can be quite early because they're not outside, remember, they're in a heated home. So it can be February, March time. Clients will ring us up and say, I've got can be hundreds of large beetles running all over the house or all over the windowsill. And very often, um, oak longhorn in Britain, not the same as the oak longhorn in Europe, which is why we use the, use the um, scientific name if we can. But in the middle picture, you can just see one of those oval flight holes and you can see a lot of where I've removed the timber so you can just see what the larvae has been up to. Always ask, have you got an open fire? Always look around the room for the log basket. You'd be surprised what you find in there. And all you've got to do is remove the logs outside. They're not going to harm the building timbers if it's phymatoid. Folks, I do apologise. I think these technology gremlins are really kind of kicking in. Sorry, Nicholas, um, just for the benefit of the audience, I think they didn't quite catch what you just said in that last slide there. It just went a bit blank. Um, so, right. So with the timber, all you've got to do is remove it out of the property, um, put it outside and let them emerge outside. Those beetles are not going to eat the timbers in the property because there's no bark on them. Okay, powder post beetle um, in the UK, Lictus brineus. Now, this is the unusual one. The female does not lay her eggs on the surface of the timber. She uses her ovipositor, which is an egg laying tube on her backside to lay eggs internally. So for that reason, she can only lay eggs into the sapwood of wide poured hardwoods. She has to go along to the end grain of something like oak so that she can pass her ovipositor down into the timber through the pores. The reason we have a lot more of this in this country is a lot of people are now using green oak, particularly from Belgium and France, as well as a lot of far eastern plywoods. And unfortunately, very often these have already got an infestation in them before they leave. It won't be a visible infestation. The eggs will have just been left. Give it about 12 months when they're over here and you will start to see an infestation over here. And in fact, down the bottom, laminate flooring, that is where I'm getting the most calls from. It's not quite weekly, but it's a lot of calls. And what you've got to do as a surveyor there, there's not an awful lot we can do treatment wise easily, but you've got to try and work out, is it coming through the laminate on the top? In this particular case, it's oak, or is it living in the backing timbers underneath? And what can we do about it? And generally, the easiest thing is to get the client to speak to whoever installed the timber and the supplier to see what they're prepared to do about it. And the problem is you only very, very often you only get small amounts of sapwood present. So it might only be one or two um, lengths of laminate that go and get lots of holes in. But obviously, clients don't like the look of that. And the other thing with lictus is, unlike a lot of the other beetles, you can find them for quite a large amount of the year. Um, they can live up to a year themselves. So they're churning over the life cycle as well as one year. So you can start to see a lot of holes quite quickly. And then we've got the boss dry kids. Um, you know, these are a lot bigger, as you can probably tell, even though I've taken these pictures under my microscope. They are a form, they are a family of powder post beetle, but they make much larger, much rounder holes. Um, we tend to get them coming in again from the Far East, fast grown timbers, lots of sapwood, and they come out in furniture in particular and household items. And then the wood boring weevils. So these again are the unusual ones. You need to appreciate that the adults can live for up to a year. The adults themselves will eat timber if it is rotten enough, if it is soft enough. 
and they will only go for decayed softwoods and hardwoods in damp conditions. So the treatment for these is to dry the timber out. Once we've dried the timber out, they will skedaddle somewhere else and go and find another person's house to infest. But they only came in in the late 1930s on imported timbers. They walk very often between properties up and down between the um, air bricks. So the damage that we see is secondary to fungal decay. And very often where you'll get that will be on a good rot job. You'll go to remove the um, skirting boards. And as you pull the skirting boards off, a lot of wood boring weevils will run all over the place. And they've what got what's called a rostrum on the front of them. And that's its little nose for want of a better word. But on the end of that nose is its actual mouth. So it's not really its nose, but it looks like Pinocchio's nose, which is the easiest way to explain it to you. OK, and then the unusual ones that Andy wanted me to talk to you about. Um, wharf borer, Nasurdes melanura. Funny enough, I had a call about that last week. Um, that has to be pretty well sodden decay timber. Wharf borer, because it used to be very common around the wharves in London, Nottingham, inland ports all those sort of places where you've put very large section timbers down into the ground and they get wet. But after the Second World War, in all the towns and cities that were bombed badly, we had a resurgence of wharf borer. And that is because when all the properties were bombed and all the bits of timber went up in the air, obviously they just bulldozed everything flat and got on with their lives. And all those bits of timber stayed down in the ground and they are still providing food for wharf borer. And particularly in London, they are still coming up out of the gratings, up out of the footings of buildings and coming into properties. Do they do any harm to the property? No, not unless they find decayed timber, heavily decayed timber. The only time I've had them physically within properties is when there's been really bad leaks on shower trays and in bathrooms and the timber has got completely sodden and the wharf borer happens to be in that area, London in particular, and it's come up and found that. Um, a beetle it does get confused with is the photo I took on the right there, which is Ragonicha fulva, which is a soldier beetle which you get on composites, those white flowers in the summer. You will see it's also got its rear end dipped in uh, black ink but it has an entirely different colour, an entirely different head, and they do come into buildings. They are attracted in at night time as well. Um, ash bark beetle and the return of solid fuel fires. So again, that was a client who, as you can see, has got a very large pile of ash logs. And the real thing with ash bark beetle, which is unsettling, they have a relatively synchronised emergence out of timbers and they come out en masse, appear on window sills, and clients go, my God, what's happened? And they don't realise again, say in the log basket in the living room, but they are only living just in underneath the bark. So again, as long as you found that, you know where they are. And then bees and wasps, wood wasp. Bees, provided again the timber is completely sodden and decayed, they can make some fairly good holes to put their larvae in um, and have a little bee's nest. These are solitary bees, but the timber must be absolutely sodden. And the same is true of wood wasp. It will occasionally come through into finished lumber, but generally it is an insect you see out in the wild. It'll be in pine stumps, which is the photograph I took below there in the bottom right. And it has well chewed timber, but you can see it is very, very well decayed. So the ones that come through in finished timber, generally they're no harm at all. If they do come out, they'll just fly away. But big round holes. And then hide beetle. Um, that will be eating meat like substances usually. Um, the reason I've put it in here is it will go and bore into timber, but they are blind ended um, tunnels which they use to pupate in. There is a larva there in the bottom photograph. So they go in there to pupate, somewhere to grip hold of. Quite large beetles, about four times larger than a death watch. And that particular one, uh, basically there was a dead pigeon over that piece of timber. And that is why they were there. They ate the pigeon 
and then they went into the timber to, pu to pupate. So just be aware of that. If it's big blind ended tunnels, it's likely to be hide beetle and you're looking for birds, nests and rubbish and lofts. And then the ants, something we are seeing more and more of. It's because of the way we build properties now. We build throughout the winter. The ants' nests are in the ground. And then the following spring, they come to emerge. They're deep several metres into the ground and they find a property in the way. And they can come up through the footings. The photos on the left there, they've got underneath a heated floor. And every evening they'll push out a load of polystyrene and rubbish. Generally, if it's ants, you should find bits of body, bits of ant body, bits of ant head. And that will tell you there's an ant's nest underneath there somewhere. Um, the one on the right, believe it or not, they were very large section um, spruce sleepers that were put for a back step for a property. And somehow the ants decided to go and nest in there. And that's the amount of frass of chewed material that they are producing. It's a very, very large pile. And plaster beetles, we will occasionally get called out to these. Um, if you see a beetle, it's a bit like a teardrop. And obviously I've taken a highly enlarged photo under my microscope. That is a teardrop. Um, that's one of the low, um, that's one of the commonest particular plaster beetles we get, but you will find them scattered all over the floor. It's only because it's called plaster beetle, because very often after you plastered new build, you will get them come in. They've come in because somewhere, as the building's drying out, you've got moulds growing. And if you haven't got moulds growing, you won't have plaster beetles. And as soon as the property is dried out properly, those plaster beetles will die off and they'll just disappear. Same with silverfish. It's just an indication that you have got damp conditions. And wood lice. Um, if you, you are there, Mr. Cook, put in specially for you. I know you like wood louse poo and it always makes you laugh. I have even enlarged their droppings for you and they have very strange droppings. So if you're in a property and you find all these strange little briquettes with grooves in and lots of grains of sand, and if you look with a hand lens, um, that is what it is. It's wood louse poo and wood lice. They don't so much eat timber and brickwork, plaster work, they work their way through it and you'll get sand grains turned out. So again, people will think they've got a wood boring insect in there eating everything and it's ju just wood lice. So dry the property out and they will go somewhere else. So returning to surveying, what are we looking at? So we need to see where beetles might be coming from. If you've got a loft full of old furniture, and packing cases, it's fairly sure that that's why they got into the loft in the first place. People have moved it from house to house. We need to be lifting floorboards. Um, about 75 to 80 percent of the flight holes go downwards in a floor. The insects know where gravity is. They know where down is and they know where moisture is. So they tend to come out downwards. As I said to you earlier on wicker, have a look at wicker. Um, we had a property once where there was a massive um, number of beetles on the window sills, looking everywhere for where they were coming from. And then behind the door in the bathroom, we found a wicker laundry basket. So was it in the laundry basket first and then went into the floor or did it come from the floor into the laundry basket? We'll never know, but it was probably in the laundry basket to begin with. And carpets and floor coverings and laminates are becoming a particular problem. I get worried about timber laminates that are hiding an ex existing heavy infestation. You know, we can't very often easily get under laminates, but we need to make sure we say that we can't get under them in case there's a bad infestation under there or one that gets worse. What are we looking for? Do we make sure we know what our species are? Do we look for whether the holes are clean or not? Can we identify the frass? So even if we can't find the beetles, we know roughly what made the holes. Dead beetles, live beetles, you probably won't see larvae unless you start poking around with a knife. If there's tapping sounds, I think we know we've got death watch beetle. Are there any signs of previous treatment? So if the timber looks glistening, it was treated, but was it treated well enough? And is that why we've got infestation? Or is it that it was only treated a relatively short while ago and we haven't gone through the life cycle three to five years in case of common furniture beetle? 
Treatments, very, very briefly, you should hopefully you'll know this. So, of course, low pressure spray. Um, I like the Eclipse spray lance. It's bulletproof. Nobody can break them unless they try really hard. And I tend to prefer a size free cone spray nozzle. You don't have to tell your technician then what a coarse low pressure spray looks like. I know a lot of people buy the very nozzle because it's easy. It's just a matter of making sure they've got it as a coarse low pressure spray. We don't need an aerosol. We're not trying to knock insects out of the air. We don't want it flowing around, floating around our technicians heads. Penetration will be a few millimeters. Um, and you need to dust, dust down and defrass if required. Um, supplementary treatments, you might, as I said, need to defrass. You might need to strength, timber strengthen. And as we've done there, that was with um, house longhorn beetle. And what else could we do? There are controlled atmosphere treatments out there. You basically asphyxiate them, but you've got to wrap the goods for four weeks. Um, you can, if you're very, very lucky, uh, fumigate whole properties or parts of properties. It's not easy. You've got to have at least 10 meters exclusion around the property. So it's not for your average des res. And you can do things like trailers. Uh, this gentleman had bought a trailer over from North America. It was only later that it got powder post beetle really badly. And we as a company were able to fumigate it at our fumigation site. But as I said, 10 meters exclusion, and you're looking at putting it under gas for eight to 48 hours to make sure you've got a kill. It did work, I'm glad to say. And hopefully that's all folks. Um, a little cartoon driven on, uh, drawn on some floorboards up in the north of England that one of our technicians found. It amused him and I must admit, obviously the householder was fairly amused as well. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, I'm liking that last picture, Nicholas. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you like that. Yeah, that that appear that that's that's right up my street. And what is this? Your poor neighbours now when next door with all these infestations you've got ready to go. To uh, well, the, the, only, the only thing I don't grow at home is dry rot. Oh, uh, that is that good would be pushing idea. it. But well, everything else, I try and keep it natural if I can. <laughs> Well, Nicholas, many, many thanks for that. As always, oh, good, they do again. these sort of things for us. They were really, really informative. And I have to say, I mean, who knew these days that we really need to be tree experts, not to be timber preservation experts. And uh, those little buggers seem to love laminate flooring these days. I mean, as yeah, a, as a worry. nothing they will not touch. And lastly, but not least, and this is principally for my benefit, what is it with all these names for bugs that I cannot pronounce? <laughs> Get someone that's not I don't, I don't know. Names. It's <laughs> yeah, but I've had a lot of practice oh. and I've listened. So I pronounce them how I was taught them by the likes of Norman Hicken. Mm. So, you know, whether I pronounce them correctly, of course, is a different matter. But I agree. It's something you have to practice. And I don't pretend to be an expert on anything. So it's just practice. It's 40 odd years worth of practice, um, you know, and obviously my hobbies are to do with conservation and insect recording and plant and bird recording. And if you're talking to foreigners, not meant in a disrespectful way, by the way, you can talk to anybody from anywhere in the world, whatever their language. If you use the scientific name, if you use the common name, you can't. And as I said earlier on, we call Phymatoides, Testaceous, Oak Longhorn. There's a really nasty Oak Longhorn in Central Europe, which makes massive holes. But it's got an entirely different scientific name, but they're both called Oak Longhorn. But if I speak to a Frenchman and I say the name of the one in France, he will know what I'm on about. Well, do you know, Nicholas, your, your, your technological depth does not surprise me knowing you. <laughs> Definitely not. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, folks, we're at that time where we've come to kind of question time. We've we've got um, uh, we've had quite a few questions, Nicholas, that have come in via email, but also via the chat in itself. Folks, just to let you know that if you do have any questions, now is the time to pose them. 
But I'm actually going to start from a question from our very own Steve Hodgson, who's actually thrown one out here. There may be a wee span on the works, so I'm going to pre-warn you just on this one. But he's asking, does Riddow now suggest Anobids can be controlled by spiders? Um, yes. You translate that for me. Yeah, um, Steve, it's in his original book. Um, I haven't got a copy of his latest book. He has found um, Death Watch beetles with uh, mandible marks in, palp marks from spiders. And he does say, you know, if we didn't kill off all of the insects with insecticides, and obviously spiders are not insects before somebody says something, then the spiders would control them. Um, you know, and he does have a certain amount of logic to that. Unfortunately, most of our customers don't want us to wait for the spiders to control them. And this is the problem with most of the things that we do. If you say to a client, tell you what, why don't we just only dry the property out and in about 10 years time, it'll all be dead. Unfortunately, the client and usually their mortgage lenders will say, you're joking, we want it treated. So to a certain extent, that is why we treat, is we're trying to um, risk assess what is going to be the quickest thing to do. And obviously, Brian's quite right. Dry it out to begin with. Don't forget about not drying. As I said to you, this is why surveyors have got to look and see why have we got the infestation? Have we had a bad leak maybe two or three years ago and we're now seeing the result of it? And has that leak been fixed? Have we got timbers in contact with damp brickwork? Can that be sorted? So it's important that we understand that. And yes, Brian, Brian that's where it comes from. Brian has found those bite marks. Um, and, you know, Brian has done one hell of a lot of work on Death Watch. That's why I've mentioned him, because, you know, if you want to really read it in depth, read his book or read Hickens' book. Um, but Hickens is obviously based on a lot older data. Brian's is far more recent. Um, and I did speak to him on the phone only the other day just to get permission to put him into this presentation. I didn't want him getting a surprise. Well, Brian, you heard it there. A lot of love over towards you from, from Nicholas and to myself as well. But kind of moving on to the, the next question. This question comes from Oscar. Oscar, sorry, I don't have your surname. Um, he's reflecting on a point in your presentation, which is, is that 8 to 12% free moisture content where eggs do not hatch? Now, I'm going to actually throw a cravat into that because see if that is the case that we get to 8 to 12% where eggs don't hatch. What are your thoughts on heat treatments and buildings then? So, um, as I said, when I gave that data, that has come out of laboratory studies where people have spent an awful lot of time with an awful lot of eggs and larvae trying to do that research. That sort of research doesn't happen these days. So that's why I said to you, you've got to remember that most of these infestations we look at, if we go and check the moisture content of the timber now and find it's fairly low, doesn't mean to say it was low a year or two or three ago when the infestation started. And that is for the infestation to start. Oh, I think we may have just lost. So if you have larvae in timber, which is drying out, they will do their level best to carry on. OK, they will do their level best to carry on their life cycle. So I have seen common furniture beetle, which are so tiny, they're literally pygmy in size. And you can tell when they're coming out that size, either the timber is very dry or there is no sustenance. And effectively, they just managed to get to the end of their life cycle before they drop dead. So you do need to be careful. And that's why you know, we say timber for fungi, it's below 20%. Timber for insects, we're, we'll normally be looking at 15, 16% in your average home, down to 9% if it's heated um, with central heating. And remember a piece of timber that say is 9% up in the room or 15, it won't be 9% underneath the floor. So it does vary a lot within properties. Okay, okay. Guys, just uh, to let you know, apologies for any kind of sound issues or connection issues there. Sorry, Nicholas, uh, just from time to time you're dropping out there. So, But um, moving on to the next question. This next question comes from Gordon Rob. Gordon, morning to you. Um, 
he's moving on to toilet talk. <laughs> oh, um, yes. Uh, the question is, is it because of ammonia in urine that we get a common display of common furniture beetles around WC bowls and toilets? I think he's on gentleman's toilet humour, isn't he? <laughs> yes. Um, the answer is, yeah, it, it's because very often in properties, um, it's in front of the toilet, unfortunately, where there have been leaks that you do get a lot of common furniture beetle. It's because the timber is obviously damper and it can be leaks from the toilets, Gordon, but I do appreciate the toilet humour uh, for us gentlemen. But yes, it's salts as well as um, the dampness around toilets. Do remember toilets also sweat. So if you've ever been on your hands and knees in a WC, and, you know, I do have strange jobs on occasions in the labs. Mm -hmm. um, you will find that in certain types of weather, when there's cold water in the WC, you will find that the WC itself sweats. And then that comes down off the, off the glazing and onto the floor and wets the floor for you. So that's one of the reasons why, yes, you do get that uh, predilection for infestations around WCs. Well, that's a bit of a bugger because now the wife actually has a real reason to moan at is that we may actually be in the same. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, enough of the toilet talk. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, next question. Oh, next question is from my very own Bob. Morning, Bob. Um, are there more reported incidents of house longhorn beetle infestations? which can be related to, to climate change. Oh, God, this is a, how long is a piece of string sort of? No, that's fine. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Uh, the answer is yes, but purely because of imports. Mm. Um, I've certainly not seen anything to suggest we're getting any more, but it is a very rare beetle anyway in the first place. I've seen nothing to suggest we're getting any more due to climate change per se, but because we are importing more timber, we're bringing in much younger timber, as I warned you. If that is infested, then we are seeing a lot more longhorn beetles in general, not necessarily um, house longhorn. Um, certainly, as I mentioned, French uh, southern yellow pine from the south of France, we've certainly had some problems with. So it probably wasn't infested when it was was sent to us but the eggs or the larvae were already in the timber mm. and then it comes out the other end so yeah we 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 are seeing more but not necessarily of all species for that particular reason so in other words europe's screwing is over from a woodworm point of view <laughs> the world is you know on imports you know, that's what we want and it's all fast grown or a lot of it's fast grown well, here, guys, conscious of time here, I probably can only squeeze in a couple of questions. So if we can maybe be quite quick with our answers here, uh, Nicholas. The next question. Yeah. Um, next question actually comes from, there's no name associated with this one, but it's a good question here. So question is, any tips for surveyors trying to establish if, if infestations are active or historic? Understand, I know, that he understands that the presence of frass is not a good indicator. So active or historic, over to yourself. We all know it's not easy. Mm. At the right time of year, it becomes easier. You can look with a hand lens at the flight holes. If they're full with dust and with cobwebs, I would suggest they're not fresh. Mm. You can have a poke around in the timbers if they're that badly decayed with a pen knife and just see what it looks like, you might find some larvae. I mean, in my particular case, I can listen to the timbers, um, but it is specialist equipment I had made for me. Um, strange hobbies that I have, but never mind. So yeah, frass, it depends. Um, depends on how it's fallen out. Obviously, vibration can cause frass to come out. If the loft, if it's a loft and it's particularly windy, the frass will move around. So if there's a pile of it underneath holes, it is likely there has been movement from adults moving around in the timbers. One thing you can do, it's not so good for the surveyor, but it is good for the householder. One thing I've done myself at home is you take modeler's um, paper or tracing paper and some wallpaper paste and you paste it all over your timbers that have got holes in. And if a year later you come back to that paper and it's now got holes through, 
you've got an active infestation. Now, I appreciate that's not so easy on surveying, but it is something that you can do that will do that. But it is a matter of looking at the holes, looking at the spread, trying to look for bodies, um, and just your, your gut instinct on what you're seeing. If the timbers are damp and there's a lot of frass around, it's fairly sure that there is an active infestation there. Okay. Well, here, Nicholas, I'm hoping just to squeeze in two yeah, more yeah. questions. If sure. you can make the answers as brief as possible. <laughs> Folks, we're just running a couple of minutes over, but if you can hold on to it, uh, if you can just wait with us. First question here. Um, from Keith um, Barker, how common is it to find steely blue beetles? Now, just to let you know, there has been chat about this within the chat, and certainly it doesn't seem to be that common. But what's your views, Nicholas? Uh, well, I would love to see them. I don't have a col well, I don't want them anywhere near my one and only Death Watch colony. Thank you very much. Um, sometimes they are found in very large numbers, which means you've got a hit. If you can't see it, you've got a, a large hidden Death Watch infestation. Um, I do have them found by surveyors and sent to me. So that is what I would say to you. But obviously, if they were too successful, that's why I say if you've got a lot, it means there's a big problem. If they're too successful, they will eat all their food. And again, with Brian, you know, he talks about the spiders, but he also talks about Corinites, steely blue beetle. So if you've got them, they will be predating your death watch beetle. So if you are, my point was, if you're finding them, you know you've got an infestation. Okay. Well, last question, which I'm hoping you can just maybe give a, a quick yes or no to just before we wrap up. Last question from George Rees, who basically is asking, is it true that timber in a building at 70 years old is really attacked unless it becomes damp? I don't think it's really about, it is about age because obviously it does age and it becomes less pal palatable. But any timber, if it's going to become damp, there is going to be a risk. OK, well, no worries. Well, here, Nicholas, many, many thanks for answering those questions. Now, folks, just in case <laughs> I've just realised a big major typo, uh, just in case, um, <laughs> folks, yeah. I do apologise. I've actually loaded in the wrong presentation for the last little bits here. Ah, there we go. I was just not taking the slide out. So, just in case you're looking for additional information, there you can visit our timber preservation document library. The web address is just on there on the slide. There, it's just property-care.org forward slash timber preservation library. But we also have a stack of information within our professional sections. The URL is up there as well. Um, just a little side note, just to let you know, I'm I'm really chuffed to say that our training is going to be back up and running just with everything that's been going on. And we're looking to start up a training on the 9th of June. If, um, if you've heard anything today and you're thinking to yourself, God, I really need to get myself up to speed. Well, our wonderful Jade and the training team are certainly there for you. You can give them a wee call, just 01482-400-000, or you can see Jade's email address just there. Just, um, just next up in terms of our kind of webinars, we're actually going to be doing something very, very different next week. That's not our usual kind of property related stuff, but off the back of Mental Health Week last week. And also because we are quite, we have been quite active about this over the last 12 months. We are putting together a CPD basically for your mind. It's um, building a mentally resilient workforce. It's really relevant, especially off the back of COVID-19, our staff coming back into the workplace. We're going to be having a look at getting back to work safely from a, a, from a, a mindset kind of point of view, understanding kind of five pillars to resilience and also about working in isolation and stuff. So something I would encourage everyone to kind of tune in. But also to let you know as well, our Tune In Tuesday is also back this week after being on holiday. For those that you don't know about the Tune In Tuesday, this is basically your forum, your place, your view. Um, it's, it's there for you to kind of come on board, ask us any questions that you want to ask us as an association and it's basically free reign we're there to give, a, give you an update of anything that we know that we can kind of break down digest wise so the url is there it's just www.property-care.org forward slash webinars 
to sign up for either the tune in Tuesday or the building a mentally resilient workforce. And um, lastly, but not least, um, apologies just firstly to anyone that had any kind of technical issues there. We will have a recording of this available to kind of pass out to any colleagues. But let me say a big, big thank you to yourself, Nicholas, for the wonderful presentation. Thank really, you. really informative. A big thank you to you guys, our audience, for tuning in as always. And uh, I hope to see you certainly next week in the latest in our CPD series. So it's a goodbye from myself for today, a goodbye from Nicholas, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. See you later, everyone. Thanks very much, folks.